um, later on. Well, um, welcome everybody. Welcome. It's pancake day today. Uh, that's part of our culture and part of my conduct is 10 minutes ago I was flipping pancakes in the kitchen and three of them went on the floor. Um, so that's, um, that, that's, that's my conduct. Um, I'm delighted tonight to welcome Leslie. Give us a wave, Leslie. Um, to uh, join us here and talk about conduct and culture within financial mm -hmm. services. Um, I think um, those are two things that uh, define us as individuals, um, define us as leaders and define our industry, um, both the good and the bad. Um, and um, I think that are hugely important going forward as well. Um, to make sure that when we're building back um, and redefining our workplace, that we get both of those things right. Um, so, um, Leslie, um, I'm going to pass over to you now. Um, thank you for um, being here with us tonight. And um, we look forward to your brief presentation. I think we've got about 25, 30 minutes. Um, and then hopefully a lively <laughs> workshop discussion um, at the end. Leslie, over to you. Okay. Just share my turtle over. Um, so good evening, everyone. And thank you very much for giving up your time to participate in this session. So I will speak for a, a bit and, and take you through my slides. But what I'm hoping is that we can have uh, an open discussion about, about, about conduct and culture and what we see in financial services and what we see, you know, how we see uh, the workplace evolving and how we see the regulator's attitude to conduct and culture evolving. So my name is Leslie Kumar. Um, I'm a partner at Insight Regulatory, which is a financial services uh, regulatory consultancy firm. So my background is uh, I've been a compliance officer for anywhere between 25 to 30 years. I'm not 100% sure where that mark lies. The last 13, 17 years of, of my career, I was at Bank of America Merrill Lynch. So Merrill Lynch, then Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Um, and the last five years of that, I was the regional head of compliance for uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa. So as I'm sure most of you, um, there, there, there have been many conduct and culture questions along my, my, my path. Um, so hopefully, as I say, we can have a, 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 an open dialogue at the end and I will just, uh, I will just kick off. So um, as we all know, the primary root cause of uh, major conduct failings in financial services over the last, let's say, decade can be, con uh, can be attributed to failings in culture. So the FCA, as, and I'm, I'm sorry if you all, you know, I'm repeating stuff that you know, but so the FCA believes that accountability and responsibility will promote good culture within firms, especially in times of adversity. And to that end, as we, we're all aware, they've introduced the senior managers and certification regime. So, let's go on. So, in 2017, the FCA launched their five conduct question program, which I'm sure you're all familiar, familiar with, and I've just listed the five conduct questions on the screen. Um, over the, that, since 2017, the FCA periodically given updates on what they think, their views of the progress that firms have made with regard to improving the conduct and culture within their firms. And having been a regulatory consultant for the last few years, bearing in mind I was at uh, BAM or Merrill's for 17 years, it's been very, very interesting from my perspective to see how varied the approach to this subject is across different firms. Most firms, as we know, have core values and principles, and there's been a lot of, a lot of um, investment in promoting mission statements and you know, visions for firms. Whilst there has been a lot of investment in promoting those visions, those objectives, those statements, um, established frameworks to test the effectiveness and compliance with those missions and statements isn't always there. Um, and I think firms are a, a different are a different 
at different stages in their evolution when it comes to conduct risks. And, and to be fair, smaller firms, you know, larger firms have the FCA on their doorstep pretty much every other week talking about conduct and culture, but there is a plethora of firms out there that don't have that one-to-one -one interaction. And actually what they see are the sound bites that they receive from the FCA when they, they, they report on what their observations are in the market. So it is a difficult, uh, it's a difficult topic. It's a, it, and you know, when the FCA were launched and they talked about conduct and culture, it was almost a different language to a lot of people, certainly to myself, what they were trying to achieve and how they were trying to achieve it wasn't always clear, particularly for the first couple of years. And I'm not sure if that was, it just wasn't clear to the firms or to myself, or they were learning as they were going along as well and I, I sort of feel it might have been the latter. So the next couple of slides let's talk about the observations that the FCA have made. Their overarching conclusion that they have repeated on a number of occasions is that the general awareness of culture and conduct issues has risen considerably in recent years and staff are more skilled at identifying <laughs> in hindsight. So I use the word hindsight because what the FCA has said is that there is less aptitude for identifying conduct risks in a rapidly unfolding situation, which bearing in mind where we sit currently and the operational upheaval that the pandemic has uh, required, uh, that can be, that is quite concerning, particularly as generally well-known conduct risks have been managed historically. Um, but they've now become much more acute in this particular environment, in this unusual and you know, environment that we're, we're operating in. So despite the progress that the FCA believes firms have made and the work that has been undertaken, they do state that the work that has been undertaken to date is incomplete and that the, as the depth and understanding of the, the ability to identify conduct risks still remains unacceptably weak which is pretty damning and that's quite a big statement and they didn't they, it wasn't the headline they sort of slipped it in their report so that's uh you know th that's something I think firms need to reflect upon because even if you haven't and I've spoken to a lot of firms for whom uh, the, the subject of conduct risk they haven't discussed that directly with the regulator so they're not a hundred percent sure of what the, the expectations of them are. I'm not saying everybody's in that boat, but certainly some of them. But if the overarching uh, statement is that the identification of conduct risk in the day-to-day -day working environment remains unacceptably weak, it would indicate that there is a long way to go. Um, the firms, firms need to improve the ability of staff to identify new conduct risks in emerging, sorry, uh, Amazon delivery. So if you hear the doorbell going, that's that's that, that's me. Um, so firms, the, the firms need to make sure that their staff have the ability to identify new conduct risks in in emerging situations, um, and along with staff being able to make good mitigating decisions, particularly in times of stress. And I'm just these two slides. I'm not actually talking directly to the slides. I'm just talking around them. So if anybody wants me to go back and forward, please just let me know. Um, as well as a strong tone from the top, the FCA believes what is required is a st strong tone from within, which will remain best practice. So what does strong tone from within mean? It means the visibility of the CEO needs to remain high. It means that senior executives and managers should be positioned as leaders of culture and adopt a much more proactive approach than has historically been seen. And it means that there needs to be a strong middle management in all organisations. That will be key to strengthening the culture of firms. Lastly, the FCA do observe that, and particularly I think this is tied into the uh, advent of uh, SMCR, the conduct rules training required by firms needs to be relevant to the employees and their day-to-day -day activities. And therefore, as a result, training has improved. But what they do note is that there is the inability to test the effectiveness of that training is, is, is an indicator 
is, is a, a indicator of weakness. So a negative indicator, shall we say. So what is the challenge? To sustain a strong culture, there is a heavy, heavy reliance on an individual's behavior and how, in, how easily an employee feels that they can challenge the day-to-day -day decisions that the firm is making. And there is a, clearly a strong balance, bet, uh, a requirement for balance between competence and confidence. A highly competent individual who has low confidence in their decision-making abilities is equally as risky as an individual who is extremely confident but has but lacks understanding of the requirements and the expectations and, and we must all have come across those people you know the very confident outgoing individual who actually haven't drilled down to or haven't thought about what is it the actual requirements what what is the conduct and culture that the firm should be adopting so those are the challenges we're dealing with individuals we're dealing with the behaviors of individuals not just the firm as a whole so ultimately, are boards asking, boards and senior management, are they asking themselves the right questions? If conduct and culture is so crucial to an organisation, it clearly needs to be managed. And if it needs to be managed, the, you need to measure the effectiveness of that management. So boards should be asking themselves whether or not their conduct and uh, their conduct risk strategy is robust and effective. Is it focused on actual or perceived issues and are the right metrics being used to measure it? One observation that the FCA has made, um, and a couple of times actually, is that most metrics that are used by firms are internally focused metrics, i.e. breaches of PA dealing rules, or um, training completion rates. Those are the things that firms can easily measure. I mean, I, I, I sat there myself looking at a Excel spreadsheet, all the things that you can measure. You know, somebody hasn't completed their training in time. There's been a PA deal, uh, PA dealing uh, breach. Somebody hasn't notified about an outside business interest. You know, all of those things are things that you can actually numerically measure. What the FCA have said is that the external measuring uh, external an external focus on measuring conduct and culture still remains absent, and that's a really hard thing to do. But the overarching question I think for for everyone is, you know, how can we trust that our staff know what good conduct and behaviour is, that they are accountable, and that they will make choices that will support the core values and principles of the firm, and meet regulatory expectations. That is a, a big question. And, you know, most most people, particularly in smaller firms, will say, look, I know my people. I've got my hands on it. We have a very close relationship. We, you know, our team is quite tight. And, and those are obvious things. And those are the things that you would say. And those are the things that you would believe. But how can you prove that? And, and I think that is the ultimate, the ultimate question. So what... Um, what we have developed is a solution, uh, what we believe is a solution, which is called CCAT. And we've developed this solution in conjunction with Kaplan Performance Academy. Some of you may know Kaplan, they're, they're pretty large. So, and, and, and it wasn't necessarily just in response to the outward looking measures that firms should be using. It was just the general when when we looked at the metrics, when I looked at the metrics that I were I was using, yeah, you know, over time you can trend. You can look at, you know, is this particular business unit uh, does it have more breaches than others? Each breach by themselves may not be significant, but does it show a pattern? Which I believe most firms will be looking at. So looking at trending information, but it is very internally focused. It is internally focused on the metrics and the breaches of internal policy. So CCAT is a confidence-based tool which assists firms in identifying and measuring critical gaps between an employee's confidence in their own conduct compared to the required standards of the firm. In other words, assessing what employees do versus what they think they should do in a challenging situation, which sounds wonderful, but you know, 
it, it is a difficult thing to achieve and it's something that we've tried to work towards helping firms achieve. So the objective of CCAT is to assist senior management in identifying the knowledge, skills, attitudes and behaviours that help or hinder a positive culture. It assesses five core competencies, managing the situation, regulatory and conduct knowledge, working with clients, representing the firm, accountability and responsibility, all core, core elements to a good, strong culture within a firm. Um, and as I say, I've combined some of these, these, these slides. So underpinning each of those competencies are a number of attributes that are actually assessed. So to assess those competencies, we, we're looking at a number of, of different um, attributes. So the assessment works by presenting individuals with a series of scenarios which are tailored to the firm. So, you know, if you're a broker dealer, if you're a buy side firm, you know, if you're an insurance firm, um, you know, it, the scenarios are, are fit with your footprint. Um, so the, the employee is faced with a series of scenarios and the scenario will require the individual to be assessed to put themselves in the position of the decision maker. So there will be a list of statements that follow each of the scenario and the individual will need to uh, assess whether the statement is true or whether the statement is false. But in addition to that, they have to list or indicate how confident they are. So it's like a scale. And it's amazing because it actually does work because it sounds very, very simplistic. And I think that's the beauty of it. It is quite simple. Um, so they have to indicate how, how confident they are that their response is, is actually right. Um, and the score, the ultimate score that comes out of each decision that they make is based on one, the correct response, two, the answer actually given, and three, the confidence of the individual that is, the, the, the confidence indicated in the answer given. So that is all put together and it determines an actual score. And so look, these are, so as I go through, you can see, let's say managing the situation, what's being tested there is uh, calling out poor behavior, manages emergent issues and situations, reconciles competing stakeholder interests, identifies the factors that shape their own and others' behaviors. And each one has, has, has similar underlying uh, attributes. So let's look at representing the firm, uh, promotes the values and strategy of the firm, recognises the impact of misconduct on the business, collaborates the, uh, co collaborates the rules and processes relevant to the job role and level of seniority, etc, etc, etc. So each one has different attributes. The end result is this. So this is a heat map that uh, was produced um, as a result of the pilot that was done in 2020. And, you know, risk committees, Lava rag status, red, amber, green. I don't know why everybody loves them, uh, but it does tell you at a glance the things that uh, the firm in this particular case should be should be focusing. So these scores can be sliced and diced in a number of ways, but this heat map, what you can see from this, um, in, and let's let's just describe the pilot. So the pilot study in this particular instance was. 35 to 40 people and if you see each line that that represents an individual's contribution so it's 35 to 40 people um, in a small medium sized uh, firm which has an international footprint uh, FCA solar regulated firm client base was a mixture of retail um, and institutional but predominantly retail and the participants were varying levels of seniority um, and they undertook both regulated and unregulated activity, for, which for this particular firm was of significant interest. So they wanted to understand how the, the people undertaking regulated activity responded versus how the people not undertaking regulated activity responded. So, you know, tech people, tech developers, etc. Um, for, for them, that was that was very interesting. But what you can see from this heat map, and hopefully you can see it, there are three real areas that are immediately highlighted that are items that the firm should give further consideration to. 
So the scores on representing the firms were particularly low. You'll see that red line. Uh, the scores in relation to accountability and responsibility, there's definitely room for improvement. Um, and the scores to rela relating to managing the situation were fairly mixed. So as I said previously, the scores can be sliced and diced in a number of different ways. This is sliced so that you can see by seniority how people responded and what their composite scores were. So let's have a look at the, the, main, the main areas that the firm needs to consider, consider. So representing the firm was the most surprising of this these results and this is and 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 everybody had the same questions it, the, the whole thing takes about 30 minutes um but representative firm was was really surprising because not only has the firm scored relatively lowly across the board senior levels scored much lower than junior levels and middle levels now usually employees look towards the senior management for guidance and to set the standards of behavior and conduct that the firm expects. But if the senior levels weren't, uh, uh, you know, were lacking in their awareness of what the firm expected of them, how, what is the message that they were disseminating through the firm? And actually there were very good reasons why this particular, this, this was one of the results. It did represent where the firm was. They were rethinking their, their core, the core principles and values. They were uh, about, about to relaunch them in a, in a different way at a global level. And so there was a, there, there was a bit of ambiguity as to what the, what the firm, what, what was actually expected. However, it's still, it's still concerning that mid and junior, junior levels were more cognizant of, of the requirements of representing the firm than, than, than the senior levels. And so when we looked at managing the situation, it seems that the junior levels were more, more likely to make the right choice. In an impractical situation, can, can firms rely on junior levels to override those of their immediate managers? In some firms, that could be an option, but in the vast majority of firms, that's very, very unlikely to happen. So whilst this is one slice and dice, what it revealed is that employees didn't understand the appropriate use of the firm's whistleblowing processes. And whilst employees had an overall clarity as to what was appropriate in relation to their own behaviour, they didn't feel comfortable or responsible for calling out poor behaviour in others. So they were happy to look at their own world, they were happy to look at their own behaviour, but when it came to calling out behaviours of peers, not just senior management, they, they didn't feel comfortable in doing that. And with regard to accountability and responsibility, as you'd expect, senior, the more senior the individual within this particular organisation, the more accountable they actually felt. But when we delve, deep, deep, delve deeper into the results, What we saw was that, as with uh, you know, calling out poor behaviour, individuals only felt accountable for their own tasks within the organisation. They did not feel a broader accountability for the firm. Um, so, and th there was also a general lack of awareness of, and this is, don't forget, this is quite a small firm. So you, you would expect the response of, we know what our people are doing. There's constant communication, constant dialogue. We're all on top of it. You would think in this type of firm, that would be the case. But in this particular instance, you know, employees just knew about their own roles. They didn't see the bigger picture. They didn't understand the overall objective and strategy of the firm. And they specifically didn't understand the, the distinction between the first, second and third line of defense. And as you know, there is a lot of focus on the distingu distinguishing the roles between the first, second and third line of defense. First, owning all the risk, second there to test it, and third there to test the infrastructure and controls. But there was a, a lot of, and, and I, I can imagine this isn't unique to this firm, there was a lot of, well, that must be compliance's job, that, that, that can't be anything to do with me, or that's risk, that, that's nothing to do with me, or, well, I've told, I've told somebody else about this issue, so I've done my bit. 
there's nothing nothing left for me to do I can absent myself so there were a number of issues a number of core things that allowed firms to actually assess what their culture was and how their staff approached conduct risk in general this would this allow them to actually focus their conduct risk conduct risk strategy not just on things that you think might be might be the issues but on actual issues that they had within their firm and as you know the regulator isn't just talking about financial bad behavior not they're also looking at non-financial bad behavior so they're looking at people's general behavior and their interaction with others uh bullying sexism you know the whole shebang in 2018 i believe it was uh, Megan Butler, you know, made a very broad statement that they are not just focused on financial conduct, they're looking at non-financial conducts and they're looking at people's behaviour in the round. Not that I think they've done a huge amount on since 2018 with regards in, in with regard to that, but nevertheless, conduct and culture doesn't just mean mismarking trades. It does mean or or you know charging additional commission or taking an unreasonable markup or you know whatever it is within your organization it does mean non-financial conduct so it does mean bad behavior in the broader sense of the word as opposed to the narrow what we historically think of you, you know the collusion that we've seen with the fx scandal and libor and and all of those types of behavior it means those but it has broadened significantly on a positive note though this particular firm, from a regulatory and conduct knowledge perspective, they scored really highly. So what can we draw from that? The training that they, they, they have rolled out is effective. It works. That's what we can extrapolate from that. And working with clients, they scored relatively well. So the principles of treating customers fairly have been embedded within the organisation, despite the varying the, the the areas where they may need to do some work there are some positive messages and so you can you know you can rely on that um in that really you know so that that is ccat and, and you've heard what i've said about what the fca expect ccat allows you to use outwardly looking metrics in conjunction with the inwardly looking metrics in no way am i slightly saying that the inwardly looking metrics are not important they're very very important but this gives an, an additional dimension so with that i've done i've done my 30 minutes i've, I've kept the time um i'd sort of like to throw it out to everybody else so the questions i think we should talk about is you know how do you feel that the con the conduct and culture is embedded in your organization how is that measured? Do you think it's effective? Do you think the regulators' presence in this area, other than the statements they make, is adequate? Um, and so I, I leave that. I, I open it up so for for a discussion, and I will I will try and stop sharing my screen if I can work out how. Leslie, thank you so much for that brilliant presentation. Um, just a, a quick question from me. Uh, you, you talk about your product CCAT there. Um, what, what actually? What is it? Is it is it a piece of technology? A methodology? A how, how would you describe it? It is a piece of technology. I'm still trying to work out how to stop sharing my screen. So uh, let me apologies. see if I can. Uh, <laughs> let me see if I can stop you from this. End. Yeah, I've got it. I've got it. Yeah. I've got it. Uh, yeah. It's a technology. It's 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 like a tool. You an individual goes in, they uh, they do their responses. It it is all turned into a central machine, which is called a, a diagnostic tool, and the results are produced. And then, you know, you it's up to the firm to to look at what 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 it says. Um, so it it is it, like an application, I would say. Okay. All right, good, good. And and how did the management of the firm that you, you did that pilot on, how did they react to their low score in that particular area? Well, it, it was interesting. There was, a, because there were very few, there was a mass panic because people thought they were being tested. 
um, and that they ha would have a good score or a bad score and that would, you know, but that wasn't the purpose of the exercise. The purpose of the exercise was to assess where they were and where they needed to go. Were they surprised with some of those results? Yes, very much so. But the worst one, or the, the, the one that you know you focused on representing the firm, when you explained it in, in relation to what the firm was actually going through, it was understandable. Um, but yes, yeah, some of it was quite surprising for them um, because, you know, it, it was quite a close knit, it is quite a close knit firm. Okay. Interesting. Right. Um, Leslie, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions out there that people, people would like to ask right now? I, I have. Oh, oh go on. So Sorry. Simon first, then Anthony. It's typical that the men in the room always bloody ask the questions. <laughs> Simon, go ahead. To be fair, I did raise my hand. You did. You did. You did ask for permission. Yeah, go on. Uh, uh, so Leslie, thanks very much. That was um, that was very very good. The um, I have a question. Do you think that um, perhaps the the FCA's focus on rules, uh, the conduct rules, you know, the senior manager certification regime? as if you like if in some way sort of retarded the progress towards you know culture and conduct because a lot of firms certainly that we interact with um they say well we followed all these rules so we're done right yeah well yes and no i would say um i think that the 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 the, the thought behind the senior managers regime and the thought behind the conduct rules and we're still a principle-based regulatory environment are genuinely quite sound it's just that actually as with everything when everybody's under time constraints you know people go through a tick box exercise they, they do you have to because how do you manage it all and the concept of conduct and culture and you know people feeling it I remember being asked by a particular individual at the FCA how do you know your people feel it I don't know how do, I, how do I know what's in somebody's head? So I get what they're, they're trying to achieve. Um, and and I, I commend it. I do. I just think there is, it's not concrete enough for people to follow until you get it wrong. That's the problem with it. In that, um, yeah, it's great. And learning from others, others' mistakes, absolutely, you can do that. I don't think it's inhibited it. I think it has put a spotlight on the fact that, and it actually spotlights for individuals at every level in an organisation as to how does that, I mean, we've all said it, how do they get away with that? And, and realising that actually they shouldn't be getting away with that and the firm should be doing something about it. But I don't think it's brought as much rigour around the process as the FCA would have wanted, is what I would say. Uh, that's probably Thank a very waffly. That's a good answer. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Anthony, you had a question. I did, Leslie. So, um, how do you? I mean, it's a little piece of how long to be a string question, but how do you advise boards to question and measure? Because this is where we, we come to. You know, as a as a board, your your ability, Leslie. To, you know, walking around the floor of Bamel. You know, you understand the culture and the comment. You can feel it to some extent. You know what's going on. From a board level, you, you're kind of sitting remote and you're given information. So what I always struggle with the, the, the measurement concept of how do you measure whether you had a good culture or a bad culture? And, you know, I mean, that, that is the challenge. And that, that is actually why we developed CCAT, to try and measure the culture of a firm as it stood. But when you're advising a board, which is, you know, that the, they are that step removed from the day to day, but also on the on the converse side, and I, I will put it out there, and Anthony, you may completely disagree with me. On the converse side, a board is removed, but when you're with the business, be it a second line function or or, or even the first, you're so ingrained in it that actually you don't really necessarily immediately recognize bad culture so on the converse side a board is removed but maybe sometimes people within the business are too proximate to be able to recognize bad behavior and there are many tools out there and I'm sure you know 
I sit on the board for a very small bro uh, Abu Dhabi bro broker dealer. I see the conduct risk metrics. I see them all. But I'm not sure it tells me anything. I'm not sure how, if I was in a bigger firm, how, if I was sitting as an INED at BAML, I'm pretty sure those metrics wouldn't, wouldn't give me as much comfort because we're talking about thousands of people. So boards um, have to, well, one, I think they need to define what their conduct risk strategy is or framework. And for me, a framework is the objective, which generally is your core values and principles, your methodology for achieving that, which is the hard part, um, how you test that you've you've reached your objective and then reporting up. So for me, that's a framework that applies to absolutely everything. Boards need to understand and make give themselves comfort that actually what the, the executives are looking at and doing on an ongoing basis is adequate to determine, I would say on the balance of probabilities, that the culture of the organization is strong, probably room for improvement somewhere in some different 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 areas, but is strong. Um, and as I say, the internal metrics by themselves don't really tell you that. Once again, another waffly answer, sorry. <laughs> Leslie, sorry, sorry Mark, um, I've got a question, is that all right? Yeah, yeah indeed, cool. hi, it, how right. are you? You all right? Thank you, yes, I'm good. Good, good. good, good. Leslie, thank, thank you. Fantastic presentation. I have a quick question. Um, I've been in financial services for, gosh, over 20 years now, and I understand the importance of conduct and risk with, with no doubt. Um, my question is, how do we make that sexy to our people on the ground in the business? You know, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult because we all know it's such an important part, but some Maybe people that are not within the SMCR region, as you mentioned before, don't really appreciate the importance of it as a, from a business perspective. So how do we make it sexy? I've got to say, even people who are in the SMCR, some of them don't really understand the importance of it either. Um, I, you know, and all of you feel free to disagree with me because this is just my opinion. But my opinion is that the only way that these things become effective is if there is a consequence of not not doing it appropriately and I, I I know I know that sounds draconian and there are a lot of people that would look at me and say but I do think there has to be a consequence how many times can you you have nice chats and talk to somebody there needs to be clear consequences for people not promoting good behavior and also clear consequences for people who are promoting good behavior so it's good and bad if people are making a positive contribution to a culture and or even people who are just plodding along they need to be recognized and it shouldn't be and i think it, and just my own experience i do feel we've shifted away from the money maker not 100 percent. you'll still have the people who will say you just don't understand what I do. You're just, you know, my job is to make money. You still have those people, but there needs to be a consequence of that. So even if you have your number one top earner, he's a complete bully, there has to be a consequence to his, his bad behavior, irrespective of, of that's going to impact your bottom line or not. And I think that has to be the boards of firms making that clear. That's great, thank you. That's really, really good, really informative. Mark, can I um, can I ask another one? Yeah, of course. And um, Leslie, in the work that you've done, um, and this I think follows on from also what you've just been talking about with boards. How um, much have you seen lack of psychological safety as a contributor to poor conduct? I mean, I know that the FCA have said that psychological safety is lacking. But if you have an environment where people are just either too scared to speak up because of the consequences to them, or they just don't trust the, the speak up policy or whatever is in, in embedded, then that's kind of like, I see it as, as quite a low starting point in order to try and get a strong, you know, conduct, a strong culture because of course, you know, your you, you culture then leads to your conduct. So if, you, if you've got a sort of in, inherently 
bad culture because people just don't trust it. They feel psychologically unsafe. You know, how, how do you see that playing out and how sort of what levels of, of evidence of lack of psychological safety have you seen in the firms that you've worked with? Well, the pilot study I was just talking about, you know, I was trying to be nice, but, you know, people didn't understand how the whistleblowing worked. Calling out poor behaviour in others, they didn't want to do it. And why didn't they want to do it? Was it because they didn't think it was their job or was it because they didn't feel safe? And I think that there is a significant amount of, if I put my head above the parapet, it will be shot off. Now, I was speaking to somebody very senior at a very large American bank, not Bamel, um, but an, another large American bank who had, and very senior individual, who had seen some uh, poor behaviour in a management meeting and ongoing, you know, it was, it was the tone. Um, and they were about to do their employment engagement survey. And they really wanted to call out this bad behavior because it was an anonymous process. But the question was how truly anonymous was it? Um, so I think the whole introduction of the whistleblowing process is meant to try and combat that. But if you look at the one big fund under SMCR, which was uh, Barclays and Jess Staley, you know, it doesn't give confidence, right? One, the fine that he got really, really wasn't that, that much. Two, it doesn't encourage people to come forward because, you know, he, in, in, as reported, I mean, I wasn't there, but went off investigating who, who had made that claim so I think I think that is a significant part of the problem. It's it's all well and good, you know, senior managers saying, oh, you know, we want to know, we want to know bad behaviour, we will not stand for it. But the one thing I, I do agree with with the FCA is this middle management permafrost, and I'm not just talking about conduct to well conduct to culture in the broader sense, you know. As a junior, you look to your manager to set your behavior. And middle management generally, not gem, not always, and this is, sorry, it's gonna, it's gonna sound like a massive generalization, but that, you know, in my own personal experience, I have found that the you know, work-life balance, you know, if your manager is sitting there till 10 o'clock, but your CEO is saying everybody should go home at eight unless there's a really good reason for it, Let's take that. Let's take that a bit earlier. Everybody should go home at six unless there's a really good reason. It should be exceptional, but not. And you listen to that, but your manager is sitting there and at 10 o'clock and expecting you to sit there at 10 o'clock. It doesn't matter what the tone is from the top. And if I'm the junior, am I going to say, am I going to leapfrog my manager and say, well, actually, you tell us that we should have work life balance. But, but my manager expects me to to sit here. Uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't really, it, 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 it would be nice and it's almost a utopia that people can speak freely. But in actual fact, I don't feel that that, and particularly in the last couple of years, and a battle, you know, no exception, there was a significant element of, yeah, you may say I can put my head above the parapet and call out bad behaviour and I can do it anonymously but people are gonna know it's me and I will be adversely affected. Um, Thank you. Thank Leslie, you. Oh, sorry, Mark, can I add one thing? Yes, of course. Um, given all of that, and I think given that you're probably um, preaching to the choir a little bit, given remuneration yeah. structures and um, you know the, the quality of the MI people are presenting, the fact we're not able to report on the things we can't see, what do you think the key levers are if, we're, if we are in positions where we want to drive sustainable culture change, like things that spring to mind for me are things like the new ways of working, women, um, uh, ESG kind of expectations from investors. What, what can we do to sort of drive home some of these other levers? Because SMCR just doesn't seem to be a little bit of a blunt tool, really. It is a blunt tool, uh, but I, I and, and the thing is, we can have this discussion for hours mm. you know we can all share our very varied and quite just dis disturbing experiences because we've seen it all however i think 
you can talk in a room for hours and say, well, it must be this or it must be that. And I think it is metrics. I think it is a black and white metric which says, no, you got it wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, it is whichever metric, forget, not, I'm not just talking about CCAP, uh, mm -hmm. but it is, it, it is actual hard fact because a lot of these discussions are about softer behaviors. You know, they're not about concrete things, which is the problem. And, you know, if you look at diversity and inclusion, uh, it's easier with uh, the women, you know, women in senior positions. That cliff exists regardless of what anybody says. That is a key, that is a clear metric that can be measured and is measured. And actually it gives firms a target to address because it's it's empirical. You know, you can see it. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you, you get 50-50 intake at, at say, analyst level and you know everybody uses different uh, titles but you know at director level it it tails but at md level it's almost non-existent you know that that cliff is just like boom. why is that everybody knows why that is why one it's because you know women have children and they're not given a safe environment to come back into to work they don't feel that the opportunities are are the same and I've, I've heard very senior management say, well, you know, don't bother employing a woman who's, you know, in her, her early 30s because all they're thinking about is having kids by that point. You know, what sort of attitude is that? And firms need to drive out that attitude. That's not acceptable. Don't care how senior that individual is. That is not acceptable behaviour and they should suffer the consequences for that. So I do think it is, it is hard fact is the only way that we can change it in my that's just my opinion mm -hmm. but i mean does anybody else disagree what what does everybody else think how do you think we can change it so zoe you're you know you've got a, a big role to play uh, with uh, culture and conduct uh, at credit Suisse. Do, does that relate i find um i find data really interesting because it's either you know, when we rag rate and dashboard up stuff, well, it's being handled by people that aren't at the coal face. So they're not handling the disciplinary. They're not handling the whistleblowing reports. They, they see a number and they interpret that number usually rather in a rather unsophisticated manner with a view to telling, manipulating it, tell the story they want it to tell. Um, by the same token, you know, a couple of whistleblowings and a couple of con conduct issues does not a you know summer make as it were um my personal view is everything's very team specific and we're a product of the environment that our management team or our function creates and it's really hard to extrapolate what's going on in one on one desk over to another um so i i don't think there's a one-size-fits-all solution to solving the culture problem but i think it the buck stops with the senior manager and the leadership team and i think their capabilities are often wanting and I think that one of their key issues is they don't empathize they're being forced to focus solely on PL um, with a couple of other issues perhaps around you know attrition um, and they're too far removed from the people that are handling the misconduct they don't investigate it themselves and I don't think they're held to account often enough as you said earlier that that yeah. final piece you know if there's a serious misconduct in your area you know what were you doing what yeah. was going on there? Where were you? It's like a parent and a child, you know, the naughty child at school. Your parent has to step up and take some responsibility. And I, I agree. I don't think we're seeing that following through. We're not. Um, I mean, and also, you know, a lot of these senior people are senior people because they've made lots of money and very good at their jobs. Great. Uh, but being a good manager and being a good leader is something that generally we leave we invest in too late they're already in that position but are they a good leader quite a number of them aren't and there is a difference between being a good manager and a good leader I think in my personal opinion and I don't think enough focus is put on making sure that people are ready with those skills before they're put in those positions and you know the damage is done but I agree with you. They just want it to go away and it, for it to be somebody else's problem. Not everybody, but quite a lot. Um, want it to be somebody else's problem and they move on. 
a manager is ultimately, and that is, to be fair, what the senior manager's regime is trying to achieve. The manager can't just move on. Ultimately, it's their responsibility. It's just that we've seen no real signs of the senior manager's regime in action. And that's not helping, right? You can no. talk about pipeline. That's great. What we need is the output. We need you to show us that you're doing something about this regulator and that, you know, you've we've launched this regime. We understand why you've got it. Well, let's let's take it to the end consequence. Mm -hmm. What you know, what 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 is the consequence for the senior manager in these circumstances? What makes them accountable? Not just a piece of paper. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Um, uh, Leslie, you, you touched earlier on um, uh, gender and um, diversity. One of the things that, um, and then obviously CCAT provides stats um, for, for senior managers. Um, I, as you know, I, I, I follow the gender pay gap reports of many firms um, intimately um, and look at them in detail and compare them. Um, and one, one thing, when you look at the stats, what you're seeing is that no improvement is being made in, in, in terms of diversity. There are fewer women in senior positions in most firms today, oh, sorry, top earning roles in most firms today than there were four years ago. Um, you know, most firms in the industry have at best uh, stationary. Um, but then you look at gender pay gap reports and the narrative that comes with them, and, and you'll think these firms are marvellous. Um, you know, uh, I've read a few today with the, you know, the CEO saying, you know, we're proud of our performance, but you look at the stats and they're going backwards. Uh, how, you know, with CCAT, if you're delivering these stats, are, are management just going to put a spin on them um, or are they going to take some action? Look, you can put a spin on anything, can't you, really? Yeah. Um, you, you can rationalise and justify but it is black and white. And there are always going to be people within firms who want to do the right thing. As in, in equal, not, I'm not saying equal and opposite. There are more firm, people in firms that want to do the right thing than there are people in firms who don't want to do the right thing, is my view. Um, and, you know, if you look at, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a great, well, I, I should be a great uh, advert for Bammel. I was promoted twice whilst, you know, I went on maternity leave both, both, both unexpected, not that anybody wants to know, but so I went on maternity leave the first time and I came back and I had a whole new, much bigger, I had my existing job and a bigger job and I went on maternity leave the second time um, and I was, the, I came back and I was the regional head of compliance. So I was promoted in my absence. That is a rare story though. That is a very rare story. People forget, and I'm not saying women have to work, I'm not, I'm not saying women have to work hard or irrespective of what I actually believe. What I'm saying is that the, the benchmark that people are judged on is different and it's not, it's not fair. And it's not, it's not just about, I mean, you know, in my time, I've known many people who were scared to come out because they worked on a trading floor and they thought they would be disadvantaged. You know, probably they would have been. So, you know, diversity, inclusion, all of that, yeah, it's all very, very important. And I, I do think we talk the talk as an industry. I'm not 100% sure we walk the walk. I mean, others may disagree with me. That's just my... Also, the whole women's support network and pulling women through. Whether you think my career was a good one or not, but all of the, the promoting that was done for me was by senior men in senior positions I didn't get the sense of the support from the senior women and I think that's changing now but you know you've got to live by what you say you, it's not just rhetoric and I, I think that translating it from just being rhetoric to actual fact is what we need to work on thank you do we I'm conscious of the time and we're nearly finishing with uh, with our hour is there a final question for Leslie? No, it doesn't look like it. 
then that it just remains, Leslie, for me to say thank you. That was really enlightening, really interesting, um, uh, a brilliant session. So thank you. And yeah, Zanatol, a big clap, a big clap. Thank you. Uh, thank no, you. thank you. And and thank honestly, you. I think I just said what everybody else has experienced here. You know, it's it it's not new, unfortunately.